Welcome to our viewers. Uh, you're watching a video presentation of Charities USA, which is the magazine of Catholic Charities USA, uh, the National Office for the Catholic Charities Ministry in the United States. My name is David Warning. I'm the Director of Content Development for Catholic Charities USA. This happens to be our inaugural video for our magazine, which is entirely online now. And so in addition to videos, we're going to be providing audio interviews as well. And of course, the traditional take out your glasses and read articles with text. Uh, today, our topic is about the work for racial justice. And given the challenging times we're living through in our country, uh, particularly the summer and fall of uh, 2020, uh, in terms of race relations and the tragic killings of people of color, uh, it's a topic that we should all discern prayerfully uh, about our role and our participation. Uh, to help us in this task, uh, we're very happy to uh, have with us our guest, who is Wendy Underwood. She is the Vice President of Social Justice Advocacy and Engagement for Catholic Charities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. Wendy, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Do you mind uh, telling uh, the viewers uh, some you know, about yourself and about your role at Catholic Charities? Sure. Uh, well, I'm uh, joining you from the Office for Social Justice, uh, which is located in the St. Paul Opportunity Center, which is part of our campus uh, called Dorothy Day Place, where we have day services, emergency shelter, and two residential buildings, along with the Office for Social Justice. So uh, we are right here with um, a thousand people a day who we serve uh, in St. Paul, um, Catholic Charities of St. Paul, Minneapolis serves over 20,000 people a year um, between the two cities and across all of our programs for children, families, and adults. Uh, in my role uh, leading our social justice advocacy and engagement, uh, I have the great privilege of really truly merging the, um, our advocacy work with our um, internal and external communications and with all of the ways that we work to reach people to um, educate them on um, the work we do and why and the people we serve, um, move them into a position of caring and so that they will act with us through their voice and support. So it's a, um, it's a very dynamic, very interconnected uh, place to be in just a really powerful, important, meaningful organization. I feel very fortunate to be here. And what a namesake that you have for, for your building, Dorothy Day. I mean, that's perfect for social justice. Right, yeah, and then we're right downtown St. Paul um, in the shadow of the state capitol and um, uh, dynamic downtown. And so, so yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful uh, message. So easy access to influence the lawmakers. <laughs> Absolutely, before COVID, uh, tours were my very favorite thing to do, uh, for sure. <laughs> because really bringing people um, into the space is the best way uh, for people to understand better and to meet our clients where they're at. I will say as a, as a result of COVID, we have been doing just that, just how you are through uh, videos, Facebook lives, um, um, really bringing people inside uh, digitally. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, our, our topic is uh, racial justice. And I imagine that uh, you know better than anyone, you guys in Minneapolis uh, were were the center of everything uh, back in May, and, and, and in some ways still. Uh, but I'm just wondering, what was that day like, uh, May 25th? Um, how did it affect, uh, obviously I'm talking about the tragic killing of uh, George Floyd, and just wondering how that affected Catholic Charities in particular, the staff and, uh, and your clients. Sure, you know, uh, uh, candidly, in preparing for our conversation, uh, I, I realized how, um, how much we are just still very, very deeply in, in the moment of that tragedy. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot, for sure. Um, I, it's a reminder, uh, Mr. Floyd died on Memorial Day. And 
in Minnesota, COVID or not, uh, Memorial Day is the unofficial kickoff to summer. And for us uh, at Catholic Charities, we were really starting to feel like we had survived the winter, a winter like none other, and we were really starting to feel hopeful that we had our arms around this terrible health crisis and that we were going to manage through. In fact, um, the Friday before Memorial Day, uh, our CEO Tim Marks sent out a public engagement email titled, um, what does a new normal look like if you don't have a home? I mean, we were preparing the summer around new normal and then Memorial Day happened and our normal uh, completely changed. Um, Mr. Floyd was killed not far from several Catholic Charities locations uh, that serve uh, children and adults um, where our staff work so hard every day to build a culture of safety and, um, and to support people who have already had just really unthinkable trauma. And so in that, in that moment and in the days that followed really as the videos were released and as more was coming uh, to light and what had happened, um, you know, clients were really, really struggling uh, with uh, what to do and how to respond um, and, our, and our staff were at a loss and how to support clients while they were also managing through this themselves. Um, you know, it came out pretty early that Mr. Floyd was someone who really shares our values at Catholic Charities, um, even worked at a neighboring shelter when he first moved to Minnesota. I was, was going to say, I was going to say that you mentioned that Mr. Marks had uh, 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 given that um, press release about the, uh, the, if you, if you don't have a home, how can, <laughs> what's, and, and here uh, Mr. Floyd is doing that same kind of work, trying to provide yeah. homes for people. He, would, he, he literally was, he literally was. And, uh, and as we've come to know, he was a man of very deep faith. And so, I mean, these, these things just also really struck a deep chord with us uh, as, as a team. Uh, and uh, over the course of that week, a lot happened. Um, I mentioned Mr. Floyd's death happened just down the street from our emergency children's shelter. Uh, his funeral procession went right by uh, one of our day centers and our administrative headquarters. Um, there were curfews across the Twin Cities and public transportation was closed. I mean, these are things we were not, we have not experienced before. And, uh, and, and so just understanding that, but then the, the deep impacts to our team members who work shift hours, they work late into the evenings and the majority of our, of our particularly our shelter staff live in the area where the tragedy occurred. And so not only were they um, uh, struggling with how to get to and from work, uh, but uh, local shops were either burned to the ground or closed, mm. um, how to get around in just in a, in a sense of fear um, for not wanting to get pulled over. I mean, just in those moments following um, you, uh, how to manage, how to, how to not let down the people we serve while also trying to make things work um, on a personal level that is just driven by such emotion uh, was really overwhelming. Would it be fair to say then that the reaction, the response of Catholic Charities, the, the, both the staff and clients is kind of parallels the, the wider community? It's kind of similar or? You know, our, definitely, um, definitely a, a number of uh, shared experiences. Um, something that doesn't get talked a lot about, I feel, is is the noise, is the sound um, that uh, that pervaded everything for several days. Uh, the the helicopters nonstop, the military vehicles that were going right by their homes. I have photos from from my porch and. A lot of other people do too. Um, the loud silence during the curfews while people were just waiting to see what was going to happen. The noise of anxiety. Uh, and those were all things that our sites were just absorbing because our sites are in the heart of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We, are, we work very hard to meet people where they're at. And so just that, that noise uh, adding to the uncertainty and the anxiety and the emotional exhaustion so the, the, the visceral and emotional responses um, happening 
yes, across the, the region and, and well beyond, as we know, uh, I feel like um, our team members running the emergency shelters, running um, housing sites with people who are working hard to manage uh, disabilities and uh, uh, behavioral and chemical dependencies are, were, were extra impacted because it was also COVID, because they couldn't come together to, to understand and, and grieve, just like you and me couldn't see a friend or a family member, uh, possibly. But, uh, you know, we've been working with people to, to I, I mean, to sit, to, to be safe, uh, and then to go through such a tragedy and just not have outlets, and then to have um, uh, your buildings burned and, and shops mm -hmm. closed for weeks. There were um, drop-offs for food and clothing that um, that I know um, you know, staff needed to use because those resources were gone. Uh, oh, that, yeah, while. thank you for mentioning that because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, those of us obviously who don't live in the Minneapolis area do not have that experience. We, we were sitting in our front rooms, our living rooms, watching it on television. We didn't have the the as you say, the helicopters above all the noise and the science yeah. of the curfew, which I, yeah, I mean, it certainly would add to the anxiety. Absolutely. You know, yeah. now that it's so, been, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I just, something that I've noticed, I've been thinking about recently uh, is actually related to the, um, the hurricanes that have been happening down south. And uh, I had, you know, I've always cared for people and wanted the best for them and know that they board up their buildings and, and do their best. Uh, but um, seeing buildings boarded up is not how Minnesotans uh, have had to respond to crisis. Uh, when we're having a really, really horrible blizzard that other people watch from home are like, why do people live in Minnesota, right? When we're really going through one of those experiences, we do the opposite. We turn on our lights. We open our doors. We make sure people know where to go for, for safety and to get in from out of the cold. We don't board up buildings. Uh, to respond to our natural crises. And so to see that, and, and people not knowing where the riots were going to break out um, over those couple of weeks, so, so all local business owners just did it. So just blocks and blocks and blocks of boarded up buildings mm -hmm. uh, was um, something that our clients and, our, and, and all of us going into work every day because we did not stop one minute um, was uh, just added to that, um, physical, emotional uh, stress. Yeah, very unnatural for you guys, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. right? Well, what, you know, looking back now, since it's been, what, three, uh, three months now, maybe a little bit more, um, how have things changed? Have they settled down? Has the anxiety decreased a little bit, hopefully? Um, how are things now? Yeah, you know, um, that's a tough question uh, because it, it's a, it's reflecting on something that you know we're really still uh, feeling, um, but I will say that um, the uh, in in the moment uh, and in those first few weeks afterwards, uh, I mean voices were raised really loud. I want to acknowledge that um, uh, that this is not the first life we've lost in a similar way. Uh, we lost Philandro Castile a few years ago. Uh, who was a son of St. Paul and uh, and was a was a very tragic loss, but really kind of the first time something like that had happened in Minnesota, um, which um, really finally caused that crack in the hard armor of Minnesota nice and 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 forced people to look at the uh, racism you know, pervasive in our community. And so that that made people, a, a practice talking about things. Uh, and then Mr. Floyd's death just really unleashed that. It just really helped really break down those walls and, uh, and get people talking in ways that they haven't before. White people and people of color talking together uh, and really pushing through. And I would say, you know, three months in, um, there's, there still is a lot of that. And, uh, and organizations are getting more and more um, organized on how to best um, facilitate those conversations and move them past just talk. Um, we need to you know, seek to understand and then and, and grow and act. 
and um, ourselves, uh, we have, um, I mean, we, we set up a number of resources just as fast as we could uh, that we uh, continue to strongly encourage people to use. Um, we are so fortunate um, to um, have our root mission in social justice advocacy, and we have a really dynamic social justice education presence. And so we, we used that to at first put out resources on um, how to talk with family members about racism, how to talk with your children about Mr. Floyd's death, how to, how to talk to yourself. I mean, just uh, how to manage your emotional uh, responses right now. We, we really worked hard to get those things out and promote um, for sure uh, using our, um, our root in Catholic social teaching and in social justice to explain how those things come together and what racism and anti-racism means um, and but putting it in a place for, for people to read and access in their own safe way. And then uh, since then, and, and things that we're actively doing now uh, include, um, we have a great partnership in the works with uh, our local Catholic Community Foundation to um, facilitate discussions among larger parish groups and, um, and people who are either um, supporters of ours or of CCF. Um, our social justice education manager has been um, working hard and frankly, thanks to being able to do things over Zoom or, or have that excuse to be able to um, bring his trainings on power and privilege and, uh, and unconscious bias and those types of things to uh, wider audiences as well as to our own. I mean, we have really, really embraced our responsibility to support our team members through all of this. And um, right after Mr. Floyd's death, we had a, um, we had a vigil, we had a, a, Zoom, uh, a Zoom morning session led by our um, director of spiritual care. Um, some other uh, team-driven discussions on, on race um, were transition for a period of time to really focus on uh, response to Mr. Floyd and, and what steps to take. Um, we have just continually used our, our active COVID communication pipelines to, to focus on um, how people are feeling after Mr. Floyd and the different things that, that they um, need to do, the, the questions they need to ask, the conversations they need to have, and then join us in, in our response. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of things, but then there's also a, what is the right thing, you know, and mm -hmm. we, that's a hard question to get hung up on. And, and by the end of the day, we push through it and we say, well, we're going to try at this point, we can't fail. Yeah. And it sounds obviously that you're fully engaged. I'm wondering if uh, some of the people that have availed themselves of your resources, have you uh, heard any feedback from them? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, uh, yes, uh, I would say in two ways. Um, uh, definitely a, a parish who recently had, had organized their own conversations and then reached out to us um, to work with our um, social justice education manager um, responded right away and in a great um, gratitude for having someone who um, who understands where, where a parish group is starting from and, uh, and can frame things in, uh, in that way of Catholic social teaching and, uh, and modern um, resources, but and talk in things in a way that is, is safe and, uh, and really um, uh, encourages people to keep the dialogue going. Um, so I think the, the, uh, the approach that we're able to bring uh, is a, um, I mean, it's a kind, gentle, honest uh, approach, uh, which I think goes well. But then I'll also say um, that our, our, our digital presence has been strong and we can literally see that in the number of hits and clicks and, and how far people look. And then in fact, um, our social justice work has been the benefactor of uh, donations too, like as a result of it. So. Um, I'm very proud that CCUSA retweets us and uh, in other places um, do actively use our resources. Yes, we definitely try to support you as much as we can, uh, happily. <laughs> I'm I wondering- in our, Oh, uh, I was just gonna say in the Twin Cities community, um, we're recognized for that work and, and, uh, and our supporters expect it too. I mean, it's, um, 
it's our mission is to serve those most in need and advocate for those who we serve. And, and we're going to do that uh, any, any way we can. And that's true for the uh, racial justice work too. I mean, you, even but prior to all of this, uh, the terrible news of this year, uh, yeah. you guys were working on the African American Family Preservation Act, really trying to help get that passed. And uh, so it's, it's been mm -hmm. a part of your efforts for a long time. I'm yeah. wondering, you know, the, when, when you talk to ahead. people, or like when I've talked to people, when I've read the, uh, the news reports and listened to radio and all that, the one thing that I hear people, some people, getting stuck on is the difference between systemic racism and individual acts of racism. And so some people say, you know, I don't see racism. I don't see people hurting black people. I don't ever hurt black people. I don't do this. I don't do that. What the heck is going on? Why do they keep talking about this? I don't see this anymore. We have all these people who are successful and they're African Americans. And so why do they keep talking about systemic racism? Have you ever encountered that type of attitude? And if you have, what, how do you address it? Sure. You know, in, in fact, uh, I mean, over this period, even just within um, our own team members, I mean, I, I feel grateful that, that we've, we've worked hard to drive a culture of, of openness and honesty. And, and so um, I have, um, heard conversations with uh, white staff members um, asking those types of questions. And then certainly um, in my legislative career and, and leading our, um, our government advocacy work, um, you hear those types of things too. Um, and it's important, I mean, to it's super important that the conversation start at that place if that's how a person really feels. And, uh, and so uh, I work hard to just use very practical, real life examples. Um, you know, I think the what's going on in Florida is an is is an example of um, people not being able to vote. Or uh, so it, right now in this time of year, you know, uh, showing how people are limited to vote. Or um, really, uh, a number of things during COVID have happened to make um, make access and security easier and faster. I mean, the amount of barriers that have been removed to ensure people have housing, have access to health care, are able to stay stable, have been fantastic in Minnesota. And, uh, and so we talk about those things, like um, a number of our uh, housing sites are um, funded, in a, funded in a certain way through the state that um, has a provision that if you're gone longer than 18 days, you lose your housing. And so that would prohibit a person from seeking healthcare or, or needing to take care of something. And uh, with COVID, that requirement has gone away. And so we are able, if someone has tested positive, we're able to send that person to the hospital and they're not going to risk losing their housing versus before they wouldn't have been willing to take the test. And so, and, and those, those things are systemic racism when we know that 70% of the people we're serving in those spaces are people of color. I mean, it's, it's just a little, be like, oh, well, you don't have enough forms of ID, so you're not going to get your benefits. I mean, it's, uh, it's, the, when, um, it's just the small things like that that right. uh, happen to our clients every day that we really try to point out. I want to acknowledge the um, African American Family Preservation Act was uh, led by um, our state representative, Rena Moran, who represents um, the Dorothy Day campus where I'm at. And, um, and there was uh, success up, uh, in passing um, parts of that act um, up until COVID. So uh, <laughs> there, was a, there was some good work in that space. And then, um, and then she and other representatives that are part of our Catholic Charities delegation um, fought hard immediately after George Floyd's death to um, pass really the low hanging fruit on criminal justice reform, but it finally passed and it, and it set up the um, the next steps and it, it got um, people comfortable with talking about it, understanding what those pieces mean, why they're important. So. Kind of wrap up our, our conversation. What, if, if, do you have any suggestions for uh, resources or anything that somebody who's interested in, uh, you know, uh, either starting or continuing the journey about uh, getting involved with uh, the work for racial justice? Uh, any, any suggestions to that, that person? 
Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the first part is uh, is recognizing the want and need to do it, and and then to jump on that. Uh, I've mentioned before uh, we have a lot of uh, really strong digital resources, um, and that's at cctwincities.org, and uh, it's a great place to uh, to help get organized on um, what kinds of things personally, and then and then importantly, really pushing to take that next step to have that. Um, public conversation and and just be vulnerable in that moment and I guarantee the person you're talking to will respond uh, because uh, America has recognized that that something has to change and that we can't stop until it does and so I um, so I would I would start right there from um, uh, with morning coffee or as I'm <laughs> thinking through things at the end of the day to um, to start reading there and then um, uh, all you know all across the country um, but definitely with us uh, there are ways to to follow along on um, particular action if you're really focused on racial justice um, we have a voter voice network that we use um, originally our sewers from back in the day that um, that we use to inform people on um, where our social justice work is at and where we need their voices and so um, someone in Indiana or Texas um, can easily Google something like that and uh, and just sign up, you know, and uh, to to learn more and to then bring um, bring your friends and family along. I really liked uh, what you have on your website. You have a, a little note that says we can't all do everything, but we can all do something. <laughs> We thank you, Wendy, for taking time uh, to talk with us today. And uh, as you guys continue to serve the people of Minneapolis and St. Paul, we, we certainly will keep you in our prayers and, and hope that your community is able to, to heal and, and unify uh, very soon. Thank you so much.